This morning, we'll consider Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32, as Jesus speaks to the representatives of the Sanhedrin and tells them a parable. It's a parable of two sons. Listen to see which son you may be, and listen closely to see if you can find the third son. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you work in the Lord's vineyard? That's a question that comes out of the text for us today. Will you work in the Lord's vineyard? It's a question. It's an invitation. It's a recognition. And... It's respectful. In today's lesson, in fact, just a few verses before our reading today, <coughs> Jesus is in the holy city, the city of Jerusalem. We know that on Sunday he arrived. It's Passion Time. He came in on the back of a donkey to the shouts of Alleluia and praise to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord. The leaders of Israel were not happy to hear the crowd proclaiming him. And not just a few members of, a, of the crowd, but the entire city was in an uproar as he came down the hill from the Mount of Olives and made his way up through the eastern gate into the temple. He was received with the shouts and cheers of a victorious Savior, a Savior King arriving back from battle. Battle which saved his people. And that's of course, as we already know, exactly what was coming. God's battle with Satan was sin and death and the power of the evil one. And we know that as he arrived in the temple courts, our Lord became incensed with a holy and a righteous sort of anger. Because the leaders of Israel had turned the outer court of the Gentiles, which God had set aside for the nations to come and worship and pray to him, into a marketplace. He overthrew the tables of the money changers. He let loose all the pigeons. He scattered the sheep. He drove the vendors out. And he interrupted and undercut the authority of and the finances of the chief priests. He was not well received by the leadership at all. In fact, now on this Tuesday, he returns to the temple to teach. This is going to be his last full day of teaching in public ministry because in 72 hours, our Lord will be hanging on the cross. Said to him are a delegation from the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews. Chief priests and elders of the people gather to confront this Jesus. Now, it was the job of the Sanhedrin to check on and verify the authority and, and the orthodoxy of the teaching of those who were teaching in Israel, especially in the temple complex. But those malefactors who come to him today are malevolent. They are not coming to check on his teaching. These men know the teaching of the scriptures. They know Jesus. They knew John. But in offering him a double question, they hope that he will respond about his divine authority as he has in the past and with his own words set a trap for him. Now, they come to Jesus and ask in verse 23, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? <clears throat> what right did he have to preach as he did? What miracles as he did? To enter Jerusalem as he did? To cleanse the temple as he did? To stir up the crowds as he did? What right do you have to do these things, Jesus? Our Lord's response is surprisingly temperate. He's not angry with them. 
In fact, in a loving way, he goes on to confront these men. And the way in which he does it is with a parable. He uses a typical rabbinic tool of a question and then goes ahead with his story. He goes on to say, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Now, which of the two did what his father wanted? A simple question. In fact, almost too simple, really, isn't it? We already know the answer. Jesus sets us up to give the correct answer in the little story that he tells. And they do. The first son, they said. Now, having been challenged on his authority, and Jesus bringing up to them a question about John the Baptist, by what authority did he come from heaven or from earth? He had already put the leaders of Israel in a defensive position. They said, well, we don't dare say from heaven, and we don't dare say from earth, because if we say from heaven, we not only recognize the divine authority of John, we have to recognize Jesus' divine authority. If we say from earth, the people believe John was a prophet. And the people will be against us. So they lie. I don't know. Well, in this little story that follows, they feel a little emboldened. They come back at Jesus with a correct answer. It's the first son. Why was it the first son? Well, let's take a little bit of a closer look at the parable. What do you think? Now, our English text that we use here this morning says, the father went and said, Son, go today and work in my vineyard. If we were to look a little closer at it, the word is not son, wheels. It's child. Techno. What does that mean? That he comes with a loving endearment for this first child, as he will the second. He says, my child. That has a little bit different sound, doesn't it, than son. My child. Will you work today in my vineyard? Go and work today in my vineyard. It is really more of a request. And let's not simply say a request. It could easily be an invitation. Will you go and work in my vineyard today? Quite a loving request from a caring father. And that's why this response from the son is perhaps a little bit shocking. I will not. You would think perhaps that this young man was unrelated to to his father. He's rude. He's curt. He's selfish. I will not. It's a little bit shy. But we're told that later on, he changes his mind. He repents of his initial response to his father. And having repented, responds by going and working in the vineyard. Now the father approaches the second son with the same invitation, my dear child, go and work today in my vineyard. Now this son, wow, this son really takes our breath away. Yes, sir, I will go. He's all light and happiness. He doesn't say dad or father, he uses a, a respectful term. Sir, yes, sir. And he sounds like he's ready at the instant to get up and go skipping into the jo into the vineyard. I will. But what does Jesus tell us about this son? This son 
doesn't make it to the vineyard. He had the proper words. He might have even had the proper actions. But his deeds were quite the opposite. Although he seems courteous and respectful, he does not obey his father. He does not answer the invitation. He doesn't even appear. Now the question comes to the people from the Sanhedrin and to us. Which of these children did what his father had asked? Obviously, it was the first. Because although his attitude was not proper, and we cannot condone his response to his father, in the end, his change of heart compelled him to do exactly as his father had asked. The word for change his mind, or change his heart here, is not the traditional word for repentance in the scripture, but it means the same thing. He repented of his sin. And in repentance, responded to the invitation presented to him by his loving father. And went into the vineyard. The other son, the other son was all words and no action. Now Jesus makes an immediate application for us this morning, as he did for the men from the Sanhedrin. He said to them, the tax collectors and prostitutes, those whom you consider the lowest class in society, those to whom you will not even minister, to whom you have written off as a lost cause, these are the ones who are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Good night. What's Jesus talking about? Aren't they the ones dressing the right way, acting outwardly as God would have them? Yes, absolutely they are. But their hearts, as Jesus says elsewhere, are far from him. Their hearts do not belong to God. The illustration or the application goes on because he connects this response with what went on with John the Baptist. The tax collectors and the prostitutes, they heard John's preaching. They went out to the river and heard his proclamation. And they repented. And they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And God's heavenly gates are open wide to them. But you went out. You heard the repent or the, the message of repentance. You heard what John confessed about himself. I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. You did not believe him. You did not believe the message of the herald of the Messiah. And when you saw all of these people repenting their sins, coming to faith, receiving the gift of salvation and amending their sinful lives, you did nothing. These people that you despise are entering the gates of glory ahead of you. Now notice here that Jesus doesn't say to the chief priests and the elders who had come to speak with him, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are in heaven and you are out of heaven. He could easily have said that. For at the moment that was the situation. But his arms are open wide. His tone is gentle. And like a loving father who says, My child, will you go into the vineyard today? His invitation is still open. Not only for tax collectors and sinners but even for chief priests and elders. They are still welcome in the kingdom of God. What does Jesus call them to do? The same thing that John called them to do, to repent of their sin and believe 
And that repentance, that change of heart and mind, is not something that begins inside of us. It's something that's prompted in us by the working of God, the Holy Spirit, who comes to us in the preaching of the Word, in the spoken Word, in the teaching of the Word. And in that Word, when it is attached to water and baptism, to wash away our sins, when that Word is attached to the visible elements of bread and wine, which become the true body and blood of Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins and the strengthening of our faith. Through word and sacrament, God comes to all people and He works on them through these means. To use His hammer of the law to break through the hard shell, that hard nut of the heart, and when He exposes the soft meat, then he comes with the healing balm of the gospel to reassure them of God's love. To reassure them that their sins through faith in him are forgiven. And that because of faith they will be with Christ in the kingdom of God forever. Now, the question comes again to us this, this morning. Will you work in the Lord's vineyard? If you look at the parable and you see the first and the second son, who do you associate yourself with? Are you the son that says no, and has a change of heart, and goes into the vineyard? Are you the son that says yes, I will? but doesn't do what has been promised. You know, if you're like me, you're going to see yourself in both sides. There are times when I resist the calling of my loving Father. There are times when I'm thinking more about myself or my needs, my wants, my pleasure, my laziness than what God has invited me and asked me to do. And then there are other times when my heart and my mind are ready. And yet for some reason, it seems as though, as Paul says in Romans 7 about the struggle of the old and new nature, the things that I want to do, I don't end up doing. And it's the very things that I don't want to do that I do. Because you see, even though the call is the same, and the Father's love for each is the same. Both sons are sinful. And I look at myself in the mirror of God's law, and I see that I simply do not measure up to the perfect standard that God expects. And neither do any of us. We cannot be of ourselves the people that God calls us to be. Because we're always doing the things that we know we shouldn't do. And the things that we want to do, well, we, well, you know how it is. I think of myself. Sometimes I think I must be pretty good. I don't murder like other people. I don't rob like other people. I must be pretty good. God must have a good feeling for me. We all are that way, aren't we, at times? Self-righteous. Look, Lord, what I do. Look at me, Lord. Like the Pharisee at the front of the temple. Look, Lord, at how wonderful I am. But then there are times when the new nature that rises through the water of baptism comes. And the Spirit of God is active more so in my heart, seems to be pumping on all four ventricles, right? And suddenly, I'm doing the will of God, and the self that gets in the way, Christ has drowned once again. As we come to the Lord in daily contrition and repentance, Christ drowns the old man, raises the new person up. 
So who are you in the text? The first son or the second son? You do know, however, there is a third son, right? There is a third son, not mentioned. On this Tuesday of Holy Week, there is the Son of God who now prepares to do God's will, who left the throne of grace in heaven and with a full and joyful heart said, I will redeem those lost and sinful people who came to be with us at Christmas to find us as God incarnate, <coughs> to live as one of us, to keep the law of God perfectly as God demands, and when it was time, did not hesitate, but went to that cross. Went to the cross for you and me. He is the perfect Son. He is the one who did it all. Did it all for me. Who did it all for you. Who put out his arms and laid down his life and died. My sins and your sins, sins of both of those sons laid upon his shoulders. The crushing weight of sin weighing him down. He died for you and me. He died for tax collectors who are unjust. He died for prostitutes who are unchaste. He died for chief priests and elders of the people who are self-righteous. He died for all. Does Jesus in this parable take the sin lightly? Does he take the sin of tax collectors and prostitutes and wink at it? Absolutely not. And I just have to remind myself from time to time, he doesn't take my sin lightly either. But, but, all I have to do is look to the cross to see not only how seriously my sin is in his sight and in the sight of God the Father, but to see how much he loves me and how much he loves you and to see that holy and innocent blood pouring down which washes away my sin, changes my heart and gives me faith that I might trust in Him and by the power of His Word and Sacrament that I might live for Him. And as the new person in Christ that I am through the water of holy baptism, that when God says to me, will you work in my vineyard today? In Christ, I say, yes, Lord, I will. And I get off my couch and I go to work with an attitude of joy because the Savior of all has taken my heart and made it His. This parable today is about repentance and forgiveness, but it's also about God's love for you. And as he prepares to go, he continues to invite, to encourage, to lift up, so that all of us who have been humbled and driven to our knees by the law of God and see our sin may also see his mercy and grace not by ourselves, but by His Spirit active in us through those means. Embrace us in His love and call us, you and I, my dear children. 
Will you go and work in the Lord's vineyard today? By God's grace, we can answer yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for a blessing. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 1030.